Welcome to the first video in our Fun with Physiology series. In this video, we are going to be talking about cellular action potentials. Now, cellular action potentials can be a pretty difficult concept to grasp. Because of the complexity, I think many people believe that it's easier to avoid or skim over this concept. So we are going to attempt to simplify as well as reinforce why cellular action potentials are relevant to the typical EMS provider. Now we're going to be using a theory called the schoolhouse theory to illustrate this concept. So in this illustration, rather than thinking of the cell as a biologic structure, I'd like you to think of the cell as a schoolhouse within a community. Now within our community, we have a lot of schools. There are schools that teach students how to control the function of the heart. There are schools that teach students how to control um, muscle movement and coordination. Um, there are schools that teach students how to control uh, brain function and cognition and so forth. So any type of cellular physiology can correlate back to this illustration. So if you were to approach the teachers and administrators of these schools and ask them where is the most important part or where is the most important activity occurring within these schools, they are going to tell you that it's going to be inside the schoolhouse. This is because that's where the professors or the teachers are, and that's where the real learning occurs. And in certain aspects, this correlates back to normal cellular physiology. For any physiologic function to occur, the action needs to be occurring inside the cell rather than outside of the cell. So and within our school, there are three students who regularly attend the school. We have sodium, potassium, and calcium. Now, there's other students as well as other players who interact with the school, but we aren't going to be discussing them in this video because they'll be discussed in further videos as we move through this series. So first and foremost, the most important student is going to be sodium. Now, sodium is a cation, which means it's a positively charged ion. And what I'd like you to think of sodium as is think of him as the party guy. These are kids that are fun-loving. They're the life of the party. And wherever sodium is going to reside, that's where the action is going to occur. So if we have sodium on the outside of the school, then the action is going to be on the outside of the school. So if sodium moves inside the school, then that's where the action is going to occur. Now, sodium, they love the outdoors. They like being in the fresh air. They like being out in the sunshine. So when sodium comes to school, they like to spend their entire day outside of the school. Now, the second type of student that comes to the school is potassium. Potassium is also a cation, which means it's positively charged, similarly to sodium. But even though potassium is a cation, it is not quite as positive as sodium. So if you were to ask potassium the proverbial water glass question, they will always say that the glass is half empty. While in comparison, if you were to ask the sodium kids that question, they're always going to respond by saying the glass is always half full. When potassium comes to school, they love the control and predictability of being inside the school. So consequentially, they're going to spend their entire day inside the school. Now, the third type of student is calcium. Think of calcium as the incoming freshman to the campus. Being freshmen, they know that they're awkward. They know that they don't fit in, but they really do want to kind of be part of the, the in crowd at the school. So they're comparing sodium. They're looking at potassium. And calcium comes to the conclusion that hanging out with sodium, the party guy, is going to be a better means to be able to fit in than hanging out with potassium. So calcium approaches sodium and asks them, hey, can we be friends and can we hang out? Now, if you remember when you were a senior in high school, imagine what your response would have been if a group of freshmen approached you and said, hey, can we be friends? Well, as you can imagine, sodium's response is pretty immediate. No, you need to get away from me. I don't want you cramping my style or bogging me down because I'm going to be leaving large. But calcium is very persistent, and they tell sodium they will do anything to be able to hang out with them. So sodium thinks to itself and realizes that they hate to open their own door. So they ask calcium that if you're willing to open any door for me, and you're there so I don't have to walk through it, I might let you hang out with me. Well, calcium thinks about this for just a moment and says, absolutely, I will open any door for you if I'm able to hang out with you. So sodium reluctantly agrees to let calcium hang out with them as long as they open any door that they need to walk through. So when we have the majority of available sodium on the outside along with calcium and the majority of available potassium on the inside, this is referred to as the resting potential. Now our cells go to a great length to achieve this imbalance. They expend a large amount of energy. And the reason why is this is where all action potentials are founded upon and start with this fundamental electrolyte imbalance. 
Now imagine that we have a group of parents and administrators of the school looking at their kids and students, and they're concerned about them becoming one-dimensional. They believe that sodium probably should be going inside the school to learn along with calcium, and occasionally potassium needs to be going outside the school to be able to learn in different environments. So they make the decision to do this by hiring a school bus driver to move sodium and calcium into the school and to move potassium out of the school. So it's important to note that the school bus driver comes in the form of an electrical impulse. It's this electrical impulse that is going to initiate the process that we're going to talk about right now. He's hired to do two jobs. The first job is to move sodium in, and the second job is to move potassium out. Now I want you to think of the school bus driver as an employee who has a really bad attitude with poor work ethics. He constantly approaches these two jobs with minimal enthusiasm as well as minimal effort, and it may or may not happen if sodium isn't readily willing to move in and potassium isn't readily willing to move out. So we start the day off with the majority of available sodium on the outside along with calcium, with the majority of available potassium on the inside. That's when the school bus driver is instructed to come to the schoolhouse. So he does his first job and he tells sodium, you need to move into the school. Well, calcium has agreement that they're going to hold open the door, and that's what they do. Is they run in front of sodium, they open the door, and sodium moves in. Now, when sodium moves in, we have a process that's called depolarization. Depolarization is the active physiologic process. So when we have depolarization in the heart, it generally correlates to the heart beating. If we have depolarization occurring in the brain, it usually equals cognition and thought processes. Depolarization of the muscles relates to movement and coordination of the body. And again, this can correlate to any normal physiologic function. Now, the school bus driver takes his first job, and once that happens and we have sodium move in and we have depolarization, is he instructs potassium to move out, which it does. When intracellular potassium moves to the extracellular space, we have a process called repolarization. And repolarization is the deactivation or cessation of depolarization. Because once a cell has depolarized, it needs to stop depolarization. And the reason why that's important is at some point in time, one of two things will happen if we force a cell to continually depolarize. The first thing is the cell is going to run out of energy. And once energy is gone, the cell will cease to function. Now, under a few special circumstances, you can or we can force the cell to even depolarize beyond this point. And if that happens, the cell will ultimately die it will rupture, and that rupturing is referred to as lysing, and it will cease to function. Once a cell lyses, depending on the cell, it may or may not come back and regenerate. So now I want you to focus on calcium a little bit in this illustration. So you notice that calcium stuck at the door. Um, this is very similar to when you go into a really busy restaurant, you have your party, you go in front of them, you open the door to the, let your party in. And invariably, there's a bunch of people on the inside wanting to come out. Well, if you're conscientious, you're going to hold the door open until those individuals come out. This is very similar with calcium, is it gets stuck at the door because the school bus driver, being impatient, wanting to get sodium in and then getting potassium out, is focused on that. And calcium gets stuck at the door. But once potassium comes out, then at that point it will move in with sodium because that's ultimately where they want to be. So the school bus driver has done his two jobs. Once they're done, he leaves. Like I said, he has that bad attitude and he doesn't really care about anything else. So once he's gone, we have all of this sodium on the inside saying, you know what, it really stinks being inside the school. And conversely, we have all this potassium on the outside saying the same thing, that it really stinks being outside. So sodium moves out to where it wants to be. Calcium is going to follow because wherever sodium is, that's where calcium is going to be. And the potassium moves back in to the schoolhouse. As the sodium and calcium is moving extracellularly and that extracellular potassium is moving intracellularly, that's referred to as the return to resting potential. And then once we have the majority of the available sodium as well as calcium on the outside, the majority of available potassium on the inside, then the school bus driver is instructed to come back to the school and start the whole process of depolarization and repolarization again. And this process will continue to repeat itself until we die. So you're probably asking yourself, why is this relevant to the typical EMS provider? So to try to answer that question, understanding cellular action potentials allows us to understand what is specifically happening within a patient's body to cause them to present with the clinical findings that we're seeing in our patients. So an example would be if we have a patient that has an increased heart rate 
it may very well be due to having increased amounts of sodium moving into the cell because sodium is the propagator of action. If we have a patient who's bradycardic, that may be the result of too little sodium moving into the cell. This can also apply to medications that the patients are taking or medications that we may be administering. If we give a medication that increases the inflow or influx of sodium, then that will increase the physiologic response for the systems that it's affecting. Conversely, if we have a medication that inhibits sodium to be able to move in, then those systems are going to experience decrease in physiologic function because there's not enough sodium moving in. We can also apply this to calcium. If calcium doesn't want to hold the door or it's not there to hold the door for sodium, then sodium is probably not going to move in to the level that it normally does. Or if we have too much calcium influence, then we're going to get more sodium moving in and at that point, we're probably going to be seeing an increase in physiologic function within those systems. So in summary, cellular action potentials have a direct effect on normal physiology as well as patients that are suffering from injury or disease. Medications that patients are prescribed or medications that we administer as EMS providers is obviously going to influence how cellular action potentials propagate themselves. So understanding cellular action potentials is going to help us as EMS providers relates to what is actually occurring within our patients. Now this concept is going to serve as a foundation for branching off into other aspects of cellular physiology. So I hope this video accomplished our two goals that we were trying to accomplish and that was one to simplify the concepts associated with cellular action potentials and to try to make the concepts relevant to the typical EMS provider. So thank you for watching this video. I look forward to presenting other videos as we move through Fun with Physiology and we continue to get cellular.